I'll be reading from First Peter chapter one, verse one and two. Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, to the pilgrims of the dispersion in Pontus and Galatia and Cappadocia, Asia and Bithynia, like according to the foreknowledge of God, the Father, sanctification of the Spirit for obedience, and sprinkling of the blood of Jesus Christ. Good morning. It's great to have everybody here this morning, and if you're visiting with us, uh, it's especially good to have you here, and we want to welcome you and, and let you know how much we appreciate you being here, and uh, if you don't mind, there's a white card on the back of the pew in front of you. Please fill that out so we'll have a record of your attendance with us this morning, and uh, stick around for a little while afterwards that we might greet you appropriately, and thank you for coming to worship God here with the uh, North Highlands Church family. <clears throat> this morning we're going to uh, talk a little bit about being redeemed and the redemption that we have in Jesus Christ. Uh, tonight uh, we'll talk about a worthless thing, and so I encourage you to come back uh, to, uh, to hear that lesson tonight and to study along with me. <clears throat> As was just read in 1 Peter 1, 1 and 2, uh, there are some things listed there. and In the handout that you have, you'll notice I've underlined specific elements there of that passage. And what you'll find is in this passage, you have uh, pretty much every element of redemption listed here and given to us uh, almost in an outline from God. <clears throat> you know, many of us know what it's like to be lost. We have been lost before. We have our, our, our cell phones and we keep up with the map on there. And if it weren't for Gary Hester going with me on, uh, on some of these uh, Meals on Wheels times when I've gone to, to help deliver that, if I didn't have my phone or Gary Hester, I'd get lost in, in our little town. And, and even going anywhere else, we like to know where we're going. We like to have directions. And we know what it's like and how it feels to be lost. You know, I grew up down in the swamps in Florida. And once you get out there and, and get pretty deep in it, it all looks the same. And it's pretty hard to uh, find your way out if you don't have a, a trail, if you haven't marked a way to get in and out of there. But we know what it's like to be lost. It's a major theme in most movies that at some point in time you, you find this point of, of lostness, either, either the people being lost or they've lost something precious or some idea of lostness. And it's continually a part of our lives every single day. And I would hope that we as Christians would look at this lostness and the idea of being lost over and over and over an illustration of our need for Jesus, our need for redemption from being lost that we find only in Jesus. You see, the fact is, man is lost. And sin is the reason for our lostness. And God is the only solution. You see, God doesn't want man to be lost. He's done what he can to help us not be lost anymore. In 2 Peter 3, 9, the Bible says, The Lord's not slack concerning his promise, as some would count slackness, but is long-suffering towards us. And he's not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. You see, we don't have to be lost we have a God who loves us and who wants us to be with Him and has done certain things so that we can be with Him. We don't have to be lost. He tells us in Titus 2 and verse 11, For the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men. You notice there are two things in those verses. Both of them say all. Both of them are talking about every person who's ever lived, every person who's ever drawn breath, every person who will ever live and draw breath, every image bearer of God, His created beings whom He loves. He wants all of us to be with Him in eternity, and He's provided a way for us to be saved. Beautifully outlined, as we've said in 1 Peter 1 and verse 2, this verse contains every element in redemption Notice with me, it says, elect according to the foreknowledge of God the Father in sanctification of the Spirit for obedience and sprinkling of the blood of Jesus Christ. He says, here are the things that God has put in place that we might enjoy redemption, that we might be redeemed. Now, let's just look at each one of these this morning and consider them with me, if you will. First, God elects according to his foreknowledge. That's what this scripture says. 
See, Christians are absolutely chosen by God. In 1 Peter 2 and verse 9, it says there, you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, his own special people, that you may proclaim the praises of him who called you out of darkness and into his marvelous light. How about Ephesians 1 and verse 4? Just as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before him in love. In 2 Timothy 2 and verse 10, it says, Therefore I endure all things for the sake of the elect, that they also may obtain the salvation which is in Christ Jesus with eternal glory. See, this is the whole purpose of the question that we find in Romans 8 and verse 33. He says, Who shall bring a charge against God's elect? It is God who justifies You see, this election, it's according to God's foreknowledge. God, who knows everything and is everywhere and is all-powerful, He sees what we are, and in His foreknowledge, before time, as we've just noticed, before it even began, He made this plan. In 2 Timothy 1 and verse 9, it says, "...who has saved us and called us with a holy calling, not according to our works." but according to his own purpose and grace, which was given to us in Christ Jesus, when? Before time began. He says God has had this foreknowledge. He's had this plan. This has been according to his purpose. In 1 Peter 1 and 20, it says, Indeed, he was foreordained before the foundation of the world, but was manifest in these last times for you. In Ephesians 1 and verse 4, Again, just as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, we should be holy without blame before him in love. You see, this is what God is saying. I've known that you were going to sin since before I created you. I've known that you were not going to be able to save yourself. I made you so that you could depend on me. I made you in such a way that you would need to turn to me, to your Father, for guidance, for salvation, for redemption. So here's where we are. When we recognize that God has chosen for all people to have redemption and that he has made a purpose from before he created the world that we would be elected to be with him for all eternity, we need to figure out And I think the religious division that we see in Christianity today is the question, well, is this a conditional plan? Is this plan conditional? Are there conditions? You see, there are some today who would teach that this is unconditional, that God's uh, appropriation of grace, that his redemption, and that entering into that redeemed state as a sinful person, that somehow it is unconditional, that it's already chosen and limited to a certain group, that it's fixed and it cannot be changed. Uh, But this idea represents God as cruel and unjust. The idea that he would say, yeah, there's redemption, but I'm going to pick these people before time even begins, before they ever have an identity or, or any opportunity to obey. Doesn't matter. These are the ones I'm saving. These are the ones that are going to go to hell for all eternity. It's just cruel. It's an unjust. And it really conflicts with scriptures that positively assert a conditional nature of salvation. You you see, God has given us things that must be done on our part. That we might choose him rather than choosing a selfish, sinful life. In Matthew 7, 21, Jesus said, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father in heaven. There's a condition. He says, not everyone comes. Although God wants everyone to come, as we've just noticed, he wants all to be redeemed. He wants all to come to repentance. He says, but not everyone who says, Lord, Lord, will come. Not everyone will be able to. Only those who do the will of my Father in heaven. This is an important moment to recognize that there is a condition, that there are conditions for us to be able to access the redemption that God offers. In Acts 17 and verse 30, 
Paul's preaching here and he says, Truly these times of ignorance God overlooked, but now He commands all men everywhere to repent. Wait a second, God. If this is a, a, an unconditional plan, if you've elected us, then why do we have to do anything? Can't we just waltz right in and enjoy the blessings of being elected people? He says, no, look, there's conditions. I want you to choose a better way. I want you to live the best life possible. And so he lays out these directions for us so that we don't have to be lost, so that we can know the way of salvation, so that we can enjoy the blessings of being in Christ. And he gives us these things. He gives us them that we might repent, that we might believe, that we might come to him and live in the way that he is teaching us to live. If his plan is not conditional, what do we do with 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, 7 through 9? Where he says, I want to give to you who are troubled rest with us when the Lord Jesus is revealed from heaven with his mighty angels in flaming fire, taking vengeance on those who do not know God and on those who do not Obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. These shall be punished with everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord, from the glory of His power. He says you've got to know God, and you've got to obey the gospel. And unless you do, he says you'll be punished with the everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord, from the glory of His power. You see, this unconditional idea nullifies all human responsibility and it reduces man to just a puppet who's just manipulated by the Lord. What about belief? There's almost no one who would say that, that you don't have to believe based on Hebrews chapter 11, verse 6. Without faith, it's impossible to please God. Whoever would draw near to God must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who seek him. He said must. You must believe. You must believe. And therefore, he shows us very clearly his plan of redemption is conditional. Because if I say, yeah, but God, I don't believe, then I find myself on the other side. I find myself living in a way that would not know God and that would not obey his gospel and therefore would bring the condemnation of God into my life for all eternity. But if I apply the conditions that God has given to us and say, I do believe, if I submit myself to God, to his way, and humbly submit to him, then I can enjoy all the blessings of living in Christ and the blessings of dying in Christ and looking forward to eternity. You know, all the invitations of Scripture and all the promises of God that we read there, all the warnings that He gives through the Scriptures, the threats and the admonitions that we find in the Scriptures, they're just meaningless unless His plan is a conditional plan. Unless there are things that I must do or obey in order to receive the forgiveness that he offers. It would mean that God does show partiality. If he randomly chose or if he, uh, in his sovereignty, decided before we even lived, who would be saved and who would not? If he decided these things without any input of our own? Yet we read in Acts 10, 34 and 35, inspired by the Holy Spirit, when Peter says, in truth, I perceive that God shows no partiality. But in every nation, whoever fears him and works righteousness is accepted by him. God does not show partiality. And God does save all of those who work righteousness and who obey by faith. You see, God elected all who would choose to obey. Over in Romans chapter 8, starting in verse 28, it says there, We know that all things work together for good to those who love God, to those who are the called according to His purpose. For whom He foreknew, remember, this plan was made before the foundation of the world, for whom He foreknew, He also predestined, what did He predestine us to? To be conformed to the image of His Son. That's what it says. 
He says he predestined us to be conformed to the image of of his son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. Moreover, whom he predestined, these he called. Whom he called, he justified. And whom he justified, he, these he also glorified. We're predestined to be conformed to the image of his son. Sounds a whole lot like what we read in 2 Peter 3, 9, that God's not willing that any should perish, but that all would come to repentance. It sounds like a perfect united message from the whole of the scriptures when we look at it correctly and we recognize that God has said, I want you to choose me. I want you to come to me and to choose me and I've elected every person who ever has drawn breath, anybody who will ever live to enjoy the blessings of Christ, to be conformed to the image of Christ when you choose God. Over in Ephesians chapter 1, starting in verse 7, it says, In Him, this is Christ, in Him we have redemption through His blood, the forgiveness of sins according to the riches of His grace, with which He made to abound towards us in all wisdom and prudence, having made known to us the mystery of His will, according to His good pleasure, which He purposed in Himself, that in the dispensation of the fullness of time He might gather together in one all things in Christ both which are in heaven and which are on the earth in him in him also we have obtained an inheritance being predestined according to the purpose being predestined according to the purpose of him who works all things according to the counsel of his will yes we're elected yes we're predestined along with every other person who has ever lived, that they would submit to the way of God, that we would live according to His plan and not in rebellion towards His plan, that we would submit and obey God. You see, the truth is that God foreknew man's sin. He knew about our lostness. He knew that we would struggle with it. And He planned a way of redemption for us, and He gave us the free will to choose His way or to choose rebellion. And those who obey will be saved. Those who do not obey will be lost. God elects, and He elects according to His foreknowledge. We also see from this passage that the Holy Spirit sanctifies. The Holy Spirit sanctifies. You see, to sanctify is to set apart. It is to take take something uh, that is just normal and just regular and to take it and change it from being uh, regular or or normal or, or, or just average and to set it aside for God's purpose, to sanctify it, uh, to move it from being something just regular to something wonderful, to set it apart. How is this accomplished? How does the Holy Spirit take people uh, who, uh, just like all other people, have sinned, just like anyone else who has ever lived, has fallen from the innocence that they had and given way to a rebellion in their heart against God? How does the Spirit do this? Really, there's only two ways. Either He does it directly or He does it indirectly. Either He directly sanctifies each person or He indirectly sanctifies each person. Now, if the Holy Spirit sanctifies directly, Is there really any need for the gospel? Is there really any need for us to preach the death, burial, and resurrection for people if the Holy Spirit is going to sanctify directly? Romans 1.16 tells us that God has put all of His power to save in to the gospel of Christ. He says, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. It is the power of God to salvation for everyone who believes. Remember that condition? For everyone who believes, for the Jew first and also for the Greek. What about Mark 16 and verse 15? He said to them, go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. Why would we need to do those things if the Holy Spirit directly is going to uh, select anyway every person who God has already chosen? You see, there's no need for the gospel if he does it directly. Uh, You know, we're not responsible for being lost if that's the case. Because it's the Spirit who sanctifies, and I have nothing to do with it. If if this is true, then there's no reason for me to try to do anything. There's no reason for me to heed the warning in 2 Thessalonians 1, 7 through 9, where it tells me that I must obey the gospel, that I must know God in order to have salvation. Well, I can't do either. 
if the Holy Spirit's going to do this directly, if he's going to do it apart from anything else and apart from my own obedience, well, then why tell us these things in the Bible? There's fact, there's, the fact is there's just nothing for man to do if this is true. If the Spirit is going to sanctify directly. But what about Matthew 7, 21? He says, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father in heaven. So it must be that the Spirit sanctifies indirectly through an object. So what is the object that the Spirit uses? Well, the Scriptures themselves call it the sword of the Spirit. It's the Bible. It's the Word of God. We wouldn't even know that there was a Holy Spirit if it weren't for our Bibles. If it weren't for the sword of the Spirit teaching us who He is and what He does and how He does it indirectly through the Word and with, in cooperation with, our obedience to God's Word. The, sanct the, the Spirit sanctifies indirectly and He does it through the Scriptures. Look with me at 1 Corinthians 6 and verse 11. Such were some of you, you were washed. But you were sanctified, you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of our God. How does he do it? John 17, 17, Jesus answers the question. He says, sanctify them by your truth. Your word is truth. You want to be sanctified? You need to get in the word. You need to listen to what the Word says and then put it to practice in your life that you might enjoy the sanctification that comes from the Spirit through the Word. In 1 Thessalonians 1, starting in verse 4, it says, Knowing, beloved brethren, your election by God, for our gospel did not come to you in word also, but also in power, in the Holy Spirit, and in much assurance, as you know what kind of men we were among you for your sake, and you became followers of us and of the Lord, having received the word in much affliction with the joy of the Holy Spirit. He did it through the word. In 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, starting in verse 13, he says, We are bound to give thanks to God always for you, brethren, beloved by the Lord, because God from the beginning chose you for salvation through sanctification by the Spirit and belief in the truth. Is that a condition? It certainly is. Not only are we going to be sanctified by the Spirit, but we must believe the truth. Can we be sanctified by the Spirit without believing the truth? No. What God's put together here, we can't separate it. We can't tear this apart. God has put it together. And he says it's through the sanctification by the Spirit and belief in the truth by, to which he called you by our gospel for the obtaining of the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. He said it's the gospel. And it's by obedience to that gospel that we can receive sanctification from the Holy Spirit of God. So yeah, the Spirit sanctifies and it sanctifies us as we turn to God and as we allow Him to wash our sins away in the blood of Christ. You see, it's the blood of Christ that redeems. God has placed His power to redeem in the sacrificial blood of Jesus Christ. Hebrews 9 and verse 12, He says, Not with the blood of goats and calves, but with His own blood He entered the most holy place once and for all, having obtained eternal redemption. It's through the blood of Christ that we have this redemption. It's only through the blood of Christ that we can be redeemed, that, that we can go from the, the desert wasteland into the beautiful garden of the Lord. In 1 Peter 1, verse 18, he says, Knowing that you were not redeemed with corruptible things like silver or gold from your aimless conduct received by tradition from your fathers, but with the precious blood of Christ, as of a lamb without blemish and without spot. He says, the blood of Christ redeems you. You see, even if we could combine all of the good things that we've done, even if we could combine all the good from every person, from all time, we couldn't redeem even one sin because we're not Jesus. We're not that perfect lamb, not a single one of us. He's the only one. And because he allowed his blood to be shed in obedience to the Father's purpose, because he gave himself as a ransom for us, we can enjoy redemption through his blood. God's deposited all his redemptive power in the blood of Christ. 
And you know, this redemption occurs upon obedience. Redemption occurs when man obeys. God's only and always demanded one thing of mankind. Obedience. Over in Romans uh, chapter 16, starting in verse 25, notice what he says. Now to him who is able to strengthen you according to my gospel and the preaching of Jesus Christ, according to the revelation of the mystery that was kept secret for long ages, but now has been disclosed and through the prophetic writings has been made known to all nations according to the command of the eternal God to bring about the obedience of of faith. He says, this is the mystery from all time. This is how God has always related to his faithful, obedient faith, that our faith would be an obedient faith, because anything less than that is not really faith at all. He says, you obey. Why would he exile Adam and Eve from the garden? Why would he reject Cain's offering? Why would he destroy the world in a flood? Why was Israel taken into Assyrian captivity? And why was Judah taken into Babylonian captivity? Why will a majority of people be lost? Because the way is narrow. He says, because they've refused to obey. This is why. And all through the scriptures, we find this teaching that he wants us to submit to his way that we might enjoy redemption from our sins. We could also ask the question in the affirmative, why was Abel's offering accepted? Why were Noah and his family saved from that terrible flood? Why was Abraham chosen above everyone else on the earth? Why is it that some will hear well done in the end? Obedient faith. Obedient faith. You see, God already elected you. He wants to sanctify you by His Spirit and redeem you by the blood of Christ. The only question left is, will you obey? Will you choose to submit to God's plan of salvation? Will you choose to follow God's way that you might enjoy the blessings that are found in Christ? Will you submit to God? Or will you continue in the rebellion of selfishness, enjoying the pleasures of sin for a season, knowing, though, that a righteous God will judge us on a final day. I want to encourage you, if you're a Christian, repent. Change what needs to be changed in your life. Make sure that you are living your life in an obedient faith that accomplishes the good things God has set up for you to do in this life. And if you aren't a Christian, please obey His gospel. Please allow God to wash your sins away in the blood of the Lamb by obeying that gospel, the death, burial, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ, that you might be standing with all those who have obeyed, all of the elect, standing before God, hearing, well done, my good and faithful servant. Whatever your need is, won't you come while we stand and we sing this song? that are higher, things that are nobler, these have allured my sight. I will hasten to him, hasten so glad and free. Jesus, greatest, highest, I will come to thee. I am resolved to go to the Savior, leaving my sin and strife. He is the true one, he is the just one, he hath the words of life. I will Hasten to him, hasten so glad and free. Jesus, greatest, highest, I will come to thee. I am resolved to enter the kingdom 
leaving the paths of sin. Friends may oppose me, foes may beset me, still will I enter in. I will hasten to him, hasten so glad and free. Jesus, greatest, highest, I will come to thee.